From coastal towns to rural farms to urban centers, climate change poses an existential threat, close quote. Bjorn Lomborg, writing recently in the New York Post, quote, Biden's climate alarmism is almost entirely wrong, close quote. Bjorn will come to the details in just a moment, but opening explanation here, climate doesn't pose an existential threat? No. Look, climate change is a real problem, and it is something we should fix, but we also need to get, get a sense of proportion here. And if you tell people this could be the end of the world for you and your loved ones and everybody else on the planet, which is essentially what the existential threat means, you are telling people they should spend everything and the kitchen sink on fixing this problem and not really bother about anything else before we've gotten this problem fixed. On the other hand, if you look at the gold standard, you might say, of climate science, which is the UN Climate Panel, and the many, many climate economists who've spent three decades or more trying to estimate what's the total problem of global warming. They said in their 2014 report that the impact of global warming by the 2070s, so about 50 years from now, half a century from now, would be equivalent to each one of us losing somewhere between 0.2 and 2% of our income. Remember by then the UN estimate that each one of us will be much richer on the medium uh, impact, probably about 350% as rich as we are today. So instead of being 350% as rich in 50 years, we will only be 336% as rich. Now that's a problem because we could have been even richer, but it's certainly not the end of the world. And that's why we need to have this conversation. If we think it's the end of the world, we'll spend everything. If we realize it's one problem among many, we will start prioritizing just like we do with all other problems. Yes, we should spend smartly. We should not spend the whole pot on this problem. The Trump administration allowed America to fall behind in the clean energy race for the future. The Trump administration abdicated leadership. President Trump recklessly threw away hard-won progress. President Trump reversed America's progress on climate change. All those quotations come from the Biden plan. Against that, I did the best I could as a layman of limited intellectual scope. I did the best I could to try to figure out what actually happened during the four years of Trump. And as best I can work it out, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States fell by about 9%. Now, a lot of that is because of the economic slowdown during the pandemic. But even if you remove that, it looks as though because of the increase in natural gas during Trump, pre-pandemic, greenhouse gas emissions were beginning, were, were slightly down, as best I can tell. So what's the, what's the premise that everything, they, everything Trump did was a catastrophe, we're behind because of him, and yet, as best I can tell, that's just not so. How do you evaluate that premise? So I think we need to recognize that climate and doing something about climate is immensely long-term impacts. So virtually nothing that Biden will do the next four years will have a significant measurable impact on on certainly on temperatures, but probably even on emissions. And likewise, anything Trump did was not really going to matter much in those four years where he was uh, where he, when he was president. Remember the fall that you talked about, and that is real. There has been a decline in in emissions, uh, certainly in the last decade for the U.S. It's actually the, been the biggest decline of any nation in the world. You're also very big, so that's part of the reason. Right. But that's because you got fracking. And remember, fracking was not at all intended to cut carbon emissions. It was intended to make you know, energy cheap in the US. But a side effect was that gas became a lot cheaper than coal because gas emits about half as much CO2 as coal. A lot of coal-fired power stations went out of business, a lot switched to gas-powered production, and that's why we've seen a dramatic decline. It happened both on Obama's watch and on Trump's watch, and it's really not the benefit of, it's not the, you know, they can't claim credit for, for this, either of them. So what we've seen is uh, Trump certainly gave up on climate and just said, we're not really going to care all that much. And I think he was clearly wrong in saying it's not really a problem. It is a problem. But I think we also need to recognize 
It is about how we long-term tackle this problem, not about what happened every any one year. On his first day in office, President Biden rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement and revoked the federal permit for the Keystone oil pipeline. Paris Agreement, legally binding treaty on climate change signed by almost 200 nations. Trump got us out and now Biden has put us back in. What do you make of that? Really, you won't be able to notice that the fact that the US joined or not joined won't make much of a difference. Now, it could be a way that we can actually try to address this problem in the future, but for now, it's mostly a symbolic act. And unfortunately, the same thing is also true for Keystone XL. Uh, even Obama's own uh, estimate showed that. Uh, they pointed out, look, it's not like the Canadians are not going to be selling 883 a uh, thousand barrels of oil every year anyway. They'll just get it out in another way. So the real question is, do you want to get it out safely, but also more cheaply so people will probably buy more of it? Or do you want to make it harder, but also less safe? That's really the question. It's a very small bit uh, player in the global emissions, but it's again, a very powerful signal. And of course, that's the problem with much climate uh, policy. It's not so much about how much good it does, it's about how much good it makes us feel. The Green New Deal or some revised version thereof. President Biden has said that he intends to spend, the numbers here are staggering, he intends to spend some $500 billion a year or more than 10% of the entire federal budget on climate. This includes money, big money, to retrofit commercial buildings across the country, expand the railroad system, apparently on the idea that it's better for the climate if people take trains instead of drive their own cars, create new jobs in green industries, and expand subsidies on all kinds of so-called sustainable energy, including windmills, solar panels, and so on and so on. Spending, Bjorn, huge spending, more than 10% of the entire federal budget. Bjorn? Well, there's a couple of things to note on it. First of all, uh, we there's a lot of things that we still don't know how he's going to spend the whole uh, $500 billion, but certainly some of these things we know are not very good investments. So the retrofitting, the uh, weatherization of homes, we actually have the world's biggest study uh, done in the U.S. for about 40,000 homes showed that the cost was about twice as high as the benefits that you reap. So spending hundreds of billions of dollars, which we know that Biden's talking about over the next four years, on a policy that'll only give you 50 cents or less back on the dollar is a bad deal. Likewise, he wants to increase dramatically uh, the funding or the subsidies for electric cars. Again, electric cars being this icon of us doing something about global warming. Now, remember, electric cars, are actually good for the environment. They emit less CO2 on average, even if they charge from a coal-fired power plant, but not very much because you still have to build them. Much of their batteries are incredibly energy intensive, typically done in China with lots of coal-fired power. So the reality is that these cars will typically over their lifetime cut maybe 10 tons of CO2. Now, to most people that doesn't mean anything, but actually on the standard, marketplaces for CO2 emission in the US, you could cut a similar amount for $60 right now. So spending $7,500 to get that amount of subsidies in over 10 years is a really bad idea. Again, okay. it's not to say that the intention is not good, but it's a very, very poor incentive. It's one of the worst ways to try to cut carbon emissions. Uh, you mentioned uh, subsidies to uh, wind and solar. Typically, the, the reality is that we can get more wind and solar, but only if we keep paying for it, at least for a considerable amount of time. And so doing that is probably very ineffective as well. It certainly typically doesn't lead to very effective cuts of CO2. So there are lots of poor ways to spend that money. And at the same time, you mentioned uh, you know, uh, that he's gonna spend $500 billion a year. Just remember last year alone, the US debt, the public debt in the US rose by $4.5 trillion. Going out and saying, hey, let's spend another $2 trillion on climate over the next four years is probably not the obvious implication of just having become $4.5 trillion poor. Right. Again, it is a way of saying, 
maybe spending lots of money is not the right way to try to fix climate change along with everything else. President Biden will, quote, lead an effort <clears throat> to get every major country to ramp up the ambition of their domestic climate targets, close quote. The idea here is that the Western world, which the Biden plan admits, if this is in writing, accounts for only a little more than a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions. That means the rest of the world, especially China, India, Latin America, account for the rest. And President Biden is going to get them to ramp up their ambitions. What do you make of that? Well, Peter, in some way, it, it emphasizes the whole idea of how we think about climate. Namely, and, and you say you don't quite know how to what, what to make of it. It's all about promises. That's the ambition part of it, right? It's about let's make sure that we make grander promises uh, next time all the global leaders are going to meet is in uh, the end of this year in Glasgow in England. Sorry, in United Kingdom, uh, because Scotland, it's not Scotland, uh, yes, in Scotland, uh, and and there they're going to make these fantastic promises. So they're going to say we'll cut a lot more than what you thought. But of course, the reality is it's not about how much you wish you'd cut; it's how much you actually cut. And there's two very important parts of this: is most people and most states who've made promises have not met those promises. You know, Canada famously uh, promised for the Kyoto deal that they were gonna you know, uh, cut, I believe it was 8%, they ended up 25% above. Uh, Bill Clinton back in 1992 promised uh, to, to get the US back uh, to 1992 levels in 2000. Uh, he totally shot that and when, when confronted with it, he said, well, it's because the economy has been going so well. And, and you can understand how poli policymakers are saying, sure, we'll try and do something in, in a long time and then we'll see if it happens. We'll see if it actually works out. Because actually cutting is very expensive and also very uncomfortable. Uh, as we've seen with the COVID crisis, we've actually seen dramatic reductions during COVID. But I think we've also seen that most people don't want that and they certainly don't want more of that. So it's very hard to imagine that you're gonna be able to get countries to say, yeah, we'd like to reduce more if that means we'll have less economic ability, less economic growth, less of everything. That's just not attractive to most voters.